welcome to Actuality Podcast. I'm the host, Dominic Wu. Each week, we will have conversations with industry leaders to explore the unexpected connections and opportunities between diverse sectors and the world of spatial AI and XR. Today, our guest is Daniel Chortuk, a data scientist specializing in predictive and prescri uh, prescriptive analytics for healthcare. Daniel's career is marked by his proficiency in applying mathematical and statistical methodologies to solve real world problems in diverse subject areas, including finance and patient care, making him a leader figure in this field. Daniel leads a team of quantitative professionals who specialize in providing business insights and forecasting for improving patient outcomes, optimizing operational efficiency, and offering risk assessment. Thank you, Daniel, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Dominic, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm excited um, to share some of the thoughts that I uh, have, kind of have accumulated along my way uh, along my journey, and uh, hopefully some of them will be helpful to your esteemed audience. Cool. Yeah. What's your journey of being where you are today? Oh, uh, you know, I started off um, liking math as a child, and uh, pretty soon I um, figured out that that was pretty much the only thing that I was good at. And so uh, that kind of predetermined my path. Uh, the, the good thing is I, I still like it. And so uh, because my training is in applied math, uh, it's relatively easy to apply the same formulas to different business areas. So um, I started off with finance and I spent about 14 years in finance um, doing things that um, you know are sometimes profitable, but some people... Uh, would argue that um, there, there are areas where uh, you can, like a person like myself with this kind of rigorous training can um, do more good by applying it directly to things like healthcare and, and human well-being um, rather than uh, the well-being of, uh, of pockets of the above mentioned humans. And so um, roughly 10 years ago, um, I by choice or circumstance, I made the switch to healthcare and I haven't looked back since. Uh, the equations are somewhat different, but uh, it's all the stuff that, uh, you know, that people generally study in school. And uh, there's generally, the results can be amazing, but the underlying methodology is sometimes is and sometimes isn't. Uh, can you explain what's the methodologies from school to apply to financial health and healthcare industry? Well, what's the study cases for it? For example, last week we interviewed uh, Ala. She is using um, um, AI model to help uh, clinical workflow process. For example, uh, she wants uh, to impl implement AI model to help like more like a streamline for the entire mm -hmm. workflow. So how can math improve like uh, the apply math uh, to help uh, financial and healthcare? Can you give us some examples that you, uh, you've worked uh, in the past? Uh, sure, yes. Yeah. So um, with respect to finance, you know, when I, when I finished grad school, uh, when I graduated, the, uh, the that was pretty much the area that had the biggest demand for um, professionals with applied math training, uh, and so there are some sophisticated formulas that tell you, well, this is this is how you should trade options, or uh, this is how you should devise your strategy for the portfolio to to be uh, recession quote unquote recession resistant, um, or this is how you maximize your um, uh, your revenue. Uh, and so a lot of people were doing that. And because this, a lot of people there, there is in finance, at least back in the day, I can only speak to that time when I was uh, employed in finance, it was quite a bit of herd mentality. If you ever heard of the crisis of 2008, uh, and some of, of your uh, listeners may be familiar and, and may remember what, uh, what happened during that time, that's when everybody was essentially doing the same thing. 
And because of that, they moved the markets and uh, they made the same assumptions. And so when things, when the dominoes started falling, they all fell in the same direction. And so, um, so that's that's kind of the uh, the risk of that. But in general, um, you can make it as simple or as complex as you want. Uh, it's as long as you're even a little bit better than your competitor, you can actually um, be quite successful. Uh, the the problem is that, that there are a lot of very smart people, and they they are all more or less they they know how to play the game, so it's very hard to get an edge. Now, um, once I made a switch, and it wasn't necessarily the easiest transition, but once I made a switch to healthcare, um, the um, you can actually do uh, make a lot more impact, do a lot more good with tools that are not necessarily as sophisticated and the benefits are very tangible and very noticeable uh, so for example well what do you do uh, the first thing the first project that actually predates my role at endeavor health uh, was one uh, that that gave um the the um uh, i would say gave birth to the department that i'm in uh, and that was the question of, well, how many people should we test for a, um, an antibiotic resistant strain? It's, it's called MRSA uh, that many people have these days. Well, so uh, if you test everybody, then likely you will you'll probably catch a lot of, of these cases. But this is, it can be intrusive. It's not too, at, at least at the time, it wasn't too fast. Um, uh, and, uh, it, uh, it, it was somewhat expensive. So, uh, the idea was the gentleman who started our department, he said, what if we have a model that shows the risk of a given patient, uh, with respect to being infected with this strain? And so, uh, he was the one who actually, um, pushed the for the creation of this model and the model was put into production as they say so it was operational uh and that reduced the number of tests from roughly i believe uh 90% or 80% all the way down to approximately 50% of all patients uh but the the number of uh, the incidence of, of of that infection did not go up so the number of cases that we missed likely did not go up and so the model that was devised using fairly simple tools uh it's called logistic regression uh so it's basically a form of of, of regression where you have certain variables certain coefficients you multiply them together yeah uh, you add them and you get a, a number which is your risk factor uh, and so that model was devised, I, I believe, close to 15 years ago, maybe a little less, uh, put into production o well over 10 years ago, and it still works. And so that's that's an example of how you can impact uh, patient outcomes at, at a relatively low uh, mathematical or methodological cost, if you will. Of course, there's the cost of implementing. There's a, the biggest cost is collecting and cleaning the data. That That's the, always the biggest issue. And since then... Uh, what, um, especially, you know, once that I was fortunate enough to join the department, I was the first data scientist hired there. Uh, since I joined, um, multiple models of the same sort predicting patient outcomes have been put into, into practice, uh, including uh, the readmission risk score, the inpatient mortality score. Well, outpatient mortality is there. It, we don't know it. We think it works, but uh, there's only so much you can do with it. Uh, there's patient deterioration model as well. And there are multiple other models. I don't want to take up too much time going through the laundry list, but we also help with uh, operational efficiency, uh, which is a model that one of my colleagues developed. She, uh, she achieved great success where I, I personally thought was very hard to do, but she, she managed to do it. Um, and uh, we also help with with marketing a little bit. We help with um, statistical consulting for writing scientific papers in the area of medicine. Uh, and we also, my department um, also uh, works, started work um, trying to help um, pathologists uh, do an image recognition. So analyzing um, different images and, and trying to figure out 
um, what what the risk is for different patients of of having a certain disease based on the image. Uh, that work is still in its nascency. We're still kind of piloting some of the approaches, but that's another opportunity that uh, I suspect we may come back to to talk about later. Yeah. So you mentioned a lot of uh, a, a lot of very um, like good examples for how the math mathematic and also uh, the the models helps to, for example, like uh, uh, predict a lot of different types of disease and reduce the frequency or like a uh, helping helping with like a readmission modality prediction and uh, what types of uh, data do you use, for example, like uh, for for a lot of like a uh, uh, patients, um, patient has different race, uh, patient has different uh, age. What types of like a uh, data do you think it's kind of like how 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 do you get those data and what types how how can you kind of uh, bridge the gap between, uh, for example, some um, I read some papers. It seems like a. Uh, uh, a lot of models because when they take the sample, they take more like a majority of the race, for example, white people, mm -hmm. men, mm -hmm. and a lot of black people or other race, they might get ignored. How, how can you balance those types of uh, like the data sample? Yeah, well, Dominic, you're sending me to a minefield without a minesweeper. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's a very controversial, very hot topic, very important. But there is like there's no there are no easy answers that I know of. Maybe you can tell me, or maybe somebody else on, on your podcast will be able to tell me how to do it. So I can tell you that um, uh, we we certainly there is a procedure. We uh, started paying attention to this a few years ago when um, you know that that question first came up in in many conversations and publications and and, and in the media. Uh, and there were some glaring examples of, of uh, well-mentioned, uh, well-intentioned uh, emissions in that area. So we do have a procedure that says, well, we have to see how this model performs in different uh, groups of the, of the population. But that this is where the kind of um, the paved road ends and where the minefield begins. So, well, first of all, uh, our data with respect to race, ethnicity, religion, language, uh, it, it is no, far from being perfect. And I just, and we're not alone in that. The only real number where, you know, where we could uh, reasonably well attribute uh, the person's characteristics is age. So you cannot discriminate against age, but that's the easiest thing to resolve, right? Uh, just because somebody looks like, for example, they are they are a person of of white ethnicity, doesn't mean that they are white, uh, and, and they may not be willing to disclose what what sort of ethnic background they they are of, or or somebody may not be able to uh, to properly record it, or they kind of look at that person and say, ah, this person looks like you know like me, the average Joe or Jill, uh, so so that the data is not it, it's dirty data not by certainly not by any nefarious means but just you know old data has a, an element of error in it um so that would be that would be one thing then another question is well okay so let's say your data is perfect let's say uh you know exactly what the the person's ethnicity is so you have for example uh, a population of, and, and I'm exaggerating here, of a million uh, white people and then 25 uh, people of Polynesian descent. What are you going to do? How are you going to build the model for that particular group? How are you going to know how the model performs in that population? Uh, there's no way. Um, so you have to, so then you have to make a decision. I'm going to build a model that works and hopefully it works for all ethnic groups. Um, but it's better than not having a model that will not work for anybody at all. And this is this is kind of the uh, the question that I always pose. Uh, I don't know how how dangerous it is to pose this question. Suppose uh, you have a choice of saving one life. Would you prefer saving 
the life of a person, for example, of a certain race over another. That is, I mean, it's right there. This, you, I just blew myself up. I just stepped on a mine, right? That, that's a question you're not supposed to ask. But that eventually, what it boils down to, it's a very hard question to answer. And, you know, religions, different religions have been trying to answer this question for thousands of years. And I, you know, you can, I don't think there's a universally accepted way to do it. So... Uh, so the way we approach it is we say, well, we'll write a model and then we'll do our best to make sure that the model is not biased. And if it is biased, it's not for the lack of trying. It's because we couldn't do anything about it. And the model is so important that we have to use it. Otherwise, uh, th there are legitimate people who may be deprived of the benefits of this model. If that answers the question that you posed. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The reason why I ask this question is because uh, last week I interviewed Ala. Ala mm -hmm. is working very hard because she is working in another project uh, with uh, for radiology, uh, mm -hmm. radiologist, and she mm -hmm. said that according to different people's background. And just like you said that you put three phys physicians in the room and they will talk different things about the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So same, same, same thing happens here because she was trying to uh, uh, apply or create data for them and training some AI model for them. But she find out that everybody's, for example, she, she, she gave me very simple example, apple pineapple or something that we've already know there's a right answer but for for example some certain types of way to describe something everybody has different ways to describe to measure it so this is the hard part so that's why i was like well, how can we create an unbiased ai model that helps the majority yeah <laughs> that's very hard <laughs> yes some, so yeah yeah, yeah so um, as for the cost savings, you mentioned that potential cost savings uh, over like a 500K from predictive models. Uh, what types of examples that, for example, uh, 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 do you have any examples that uh, it can help like a, a saving the cost or something that save more time than before for the, the uh, kind of the study case you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, you know, we have to put an asterisk to this number. 500K is an estimate, which looks good, but it's not exact to begin with. Uh, so another footnote is that uh, according to the U.S. Department of Transportation, the value of a human life is $12.5 million. I don't know where they got this number, <laughs> uh, but you can you can go to their website and check. Uh, so, um, you know, so if you save one human life, well, you can probably justify the existence of my whole department from for quite a bit more than one year. So, uh, so that having said that, there there are certain tangibles. Specifically, I think the the project that um, you're referring to is the one it was actually the very first. I think it's a great example. The very first project that I did when I joined Endeavor Health, which was back then called North Shore University Health System. Uh, was um, brought to us by a lady. I think she had it. I can't remember if she had it. The uh, the medical practice, or she was in charge of finance. I, I, I I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly. And my apologies to her. Um, but the question was, well, here is a let's say a, a pool of our surgeons, and these surgeons use different supplies. Uh, to perform their procedures. Let's say orthopedic surgeons or heart surgeons, or even let's say, for example, not even surgeons, let's say psychiatrists, they prescribe different medications and they keep their patients in the, in the hospital for different periods of time. So why don't we try to figure out why um, there is such a big difference between, well, first of all, why our, our costs are the way they are. And so immediately, you know, I, I pulled the data with some help and looked at the, uh, at the costs and the costs were all over the place. And so uh, the next question is, well, why, right? So if you, for example, if you um, take a sample of homeowners who are trying to remodel a bathroom, 
So you will see it, it will be, at my prediction, I've never done it myself, but my prediction is it will be very stratified. It will be like a little cluster of, uh, or maybe not so little, a pretty big cluster of those who buy cheap materials and use cheap labor and try to do it as cheaply as they can. And then the second one in the middle and the third one will be at the top. But in the case of physicians, uh, that's not the case. They're, they could be, you know, using the most expensive um, I don't know, joint prosthesis, like an artificial joint. And then they go down and they buy, let's say, the cheapest cement they can get. Uh, and so it's like up and down. So there's no, doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, but there was quite a bit of variability. So so what I did, that's, that's actually a great example of how you can uh, extract some value without doing a whole lot of stuff because the uh it was just just a pretty plot with different uh, different physicians plotted and then the cost of their supplies and the number of procedures that they do and then you you can immediately see well this is you can save let's say this guy takes a lot um a lot of expensive supplies but uh they they do 10 procedures a year or something like that uh, so even if we reduce the cost, it's not going to help. Um, at the same time, somebody does a lot of these procedures. So if we bring the cost down just a little bit, uh, then maybe we can realize some savings. And so um, eventually that plot made its way to the physicians and there was an eye opener. They, in some of them, in, in, in good faith, they said, I didn't know. I didn't realize that I'm here. I, I'm using these expensive supplies I'm just using them because the you know the, the sales rep told me they're good. But if I can use cheaper supplies, I don't care. So that is that is where um, you know just by means of educating uh, surgeons and, and other providers uh, on the relative cost of what they use, we were able to bring those costs down. Uh, another example is uh, revenue integrity. So that means if you, uh, for example, if you bill for a certain procedure, there are certain procedure codes that go together. And if one of them is missed, and it's fairly formalized for certain types of procedures, if one of them is missed, then you, the organization, the provider is not going to pay, get paid for the work they did, which is not fair. So you can actually formalize it, use an algorithm. One of my colleagues actually did it. Um, and uh, that that led to some savings there. Um, so, and then of course, um, patient readmission, if we can properly address unplanned readmissions, then we reduce, we improve patient satisfaction, we reduce the costs, and then we reduce the penalties assessed to us if those patients um, are supported by Medicare. So um, I hope that answers your question. So the possibilities are endless, putting a hard number on them is not, not easy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Just like you said that, how what's one life's worth it depends on you know everybody has different price like on the official document it's like one million you just mentioned but you know in some places maybe yeah it's it, yeah it all depends on um how, how how much you think and uh, a lot of times those values is very hard to predict and uh, recently i listened to um uh tech talk um, I listened to one of the episodes that uh, Fei Fei Li uh, uh, mentioned that he, uh, she has uh, kind of like a, a group of students doing ambient, uh, ambient intelligence, <laughs> ambient intelligence, mm -hmm. which means that um, they use computer vision and AI and uh, just uh, putting, I don't know, somewhere in the room and start to uh, tracking the device. Uh, because it seems like the device, sometimes people uh, are lost or couldn't track and it takes a lot of labor and time just to 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 deal with the equipment. So it just ambient, it just being there, but at the end it will uh, track or keep um, um, uh, analyze all the equipment being used. So I think it's also just like you mentioned that supplied, um, uh, there's another way to reduce costs and by uh, doing uh, like applying some 
uh, math and also uh, optimize the, the procedures for administration. It also helps uh, to reduce mm -hmm. the penalties. Yeah, so um, as for um, the AI for patient risk identification, how does AI help identify a patient at high risk of all those types of, for example, like administration, re-administration and mortality? Do you have any other examples for, for example, like uh, um, if the AI model being implemented into this and um, I, I saw the mortality, uh, is there any examples um, uh, because it relates to uh, either life or death. So uh, any improvement for those types of uh, study case? Yeah, um, so, so this is a loaded question, Dominic. Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, we have to agree on what AI is and is not. So my, my firm belief is that the models that we use uh, most of them are not AI. So logistic regression is not AI. Linear regression is not AI. Random forests are not AI. Uh, it's machine learning, yes, but it's not AI. Uh, so with AI, what my understanding is, it is, well, definitely large language models are, and uh, NLP is image recognition. You can argue that that is AI as well. So... Uh, but we don't, so far, we haven't used any of those tools uh, to do what we're doing for predicting patient risk because, well, for one, uh, many of them are quite expensive. Uh, for another, we have a relatively small data science team. Uh, we have, right now, we have uh, six people together. And so we can compete with, with the likes of Google or Microsoft in, in uh, developing our own algorithms. And uh, so we can only partner with them and, and try to do something together. But uh, that's it's in the works, by the way, but it, it just takes time. Uh, so what we do, what, like I said, what we use, it's uh, basic kind of statistics and, and uh, machine learning methods that have been in use for, you know, at least 20 years, some of them maybe for 100 years. So um, how does it help? Well, you uh, effectively, so if you have limited resources, uh, you have to allocate those resources to the, to the patients uh, who are at most risk. So uh, if you, let's say, if you have uh, one nurse who can, uh, or, or one caseworker who can start making calls and making sure that patients follow up on their uh, hospital procedures and they make their follow-up appointments, that person cannot uh, call, let's say, 100 patients in a day. They, they would have to, after that, they would have to go on a two-week vacation, something, if they're still alive after that. Um, so... Uh, so instead of calling 100, you look at the list of patients, let's say, ranked in reverse order, descending order uh, by their risk, and then you call the patients at the top of the list, maybe not 100, but maybe 20, and then you make sure that, that you do what you can for them, uh, hoping that your model is good enough so it, the, the prevalence of, of uh, negative outcomes in that group would have been higher than the prevalence, it, you know, that the Pareto rule, the 2080 rule. So 80% uh, of, of problems occur in, in, in let's say, 20% of patients. Again, I'm exaggerating wildly here. This is not a, a mathematically uh, sound statement. But uh, that, so, so this is what we do. And we, we take the variables, usually we take um, uh, you know, anywhere between 20 and 40 and sometimes fewer than that variables. And it's amazing how a simple model works quite a bit better than no model at all. So that's, that, that's what we do. Of course, we would love to do image recognition. And, uh, and, and by the way, yeah, I did my homework. So, uh, I, I did watch that uh, TED talk by Fei Fei, and, and she's an amazing person. I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So the, we are, for now, we are certainly, shouldn't be using words like certainly and obviously, but we are far removed from, from where she is. I mean, she's at the cutting edge at the forefront. We are trying to catch up with the resources we have. So that answers your question. Yeah, the, the, yeah, this is very cool because I think um, we, we, we all know that um, AI, because right now, the because of AI hype recently, so 
all the business people just think that oh if I put AI, I can solve the problem. But just like you said that, even though you implement the model, it's just slightly being better for the prediction. Um, there are still a lot of uh, things that we can do and to calculate better. So just like a 2080, I mean, it's kind of a philosophy, but it's actually doing the, the majority of the world kind of happens to here, like a 20%, you just mentioned 20% of patients usually cost 80% of the effort to take care of them. So yeah, so I think those like a kind of like a doing like a, the high risk and for physicians to prioritize. I think this is uh, a very good model. And you also mentioned like a, a sepsis risk model. Can you describe like a, uh, the, the model and how it helps people? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I can talk about it. I cannot, um, you know, I cannot go into any specifics, not because yeah. there's anything proprietary about it. It's because we're using, um, well, first of all, we're not really building any uh, any workflows around the model per se. We're trying to build workflows around the, the idea of prevention. And so we do, um, our uh, electronic medical records provider uh, does have a built-in model uh, but the the performance of that model, according to many sources, uh, is not all that great. And the the, um, the the company that develops the software admits that first and foremost, they say, yeah, we know our model is not great, but that's the only model we have um, because it's so hard to model this uh, this the, the instances of sepsis and, and and it's not always accurately recorded. So the data is bad. Uh, it's incomplete. And so, uh, the idea, of course, would be to um, to identify patients at high risk of sepsis early and then work them up. It's a term meaning that you preventive, uh, yeah, proactively, uh, you know, administer medications and you observe them and you uh, put them in the ICU if you have to, intensive care unit. Um, so, uh, but that is, I mean, the, so far it's kind of, at the stage where we're looking into it, we're not actively using the model and we don't know how well it works in our environment. So I can't really speak to that to, at, at, with any kind of specificity. Yeah, and uh, also, um, yeah, it, it, it's good because the reason why I ask is because I'm involving in the kind of uh, uh, VR training development for uh, sepsis uh, nursing training. So um, mm -hmm. I just watch a lot of videos that from the experts tell me how to do all the procedures. And uh, the interesting thing is that when I ask like, do you have any correct answer? I, cause I like to, for, for um, developer or for data scientists, I mm -hmm. believe you mm -hmm. kind of want people to give you specific answer. What's this way to do right? What's oh, the way to yeah. do wrong? And uh, uh, usually my answer is the, the, um, the nurse job is a chaos. You just dump, you, you, just, you, you just get into mm -hmm. this environment and there are yep. tons of things and everybody's yep. scenario is different. So there's no exactly right answer. So which kind of make me yes. a little panic because I want as detailed as possible and make sure nothing is wrong. But it seems like in this types of um, Medicare, the data is just approximately, yes. there's no right answer. Yeah. And even for example, if you see the textbook and versus someone's experience, there's always some yes. something different. So that's why I find out this is like a wow. I, yeah, I, I, I think this is amazing that people can make a model of it because it's just, there's no right answer. You are trying to do yes, something. You you have to, yeah, well, I mean, you, you have to work with what you have. Yes, yes. So, yeah. And uh, um, in, um, um, yeah, like uh, you mentioned that COVID-19 uh, uh, modeling, uh, is there any mm -hmm. like uh, ways to do the COVID-19 like a uh, model and how does it work and how uh, did it improve uh, people's life or save life? 
Sure. Yeah. So that you can, you know, we, we, we can spend the rest of the podcast talking about that because this, <laughs> this is my, one of my pet projects that I, I think, you know, my, my team did uh, reasonably well and it was, uh, that much was acknowledged by our management, but uh, we didn't do anything out of the ordinary. If you remember the beginning of, of the pandemic, everybody was trying to figure out what's coming. So I, I I remember my first encounter with with a real COVID case. Now, believe it or not, um, my manager and I went to a meeting in downtown Chicago, and then afterwards uh, we got a phone call. I think it was a phone call, or maybe it would have, it was an email, and it said you were in the same building as a person who had COVID. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know, and the building has I don't know forty eight stories or, or something like that but you uh, you may have been riding in the same elevator or you may have touched the same elevator button or whatnot uh so that was i it, the, the, of course in hindsight it, it sounds silly but everybody was was scared and for a good reason um i do work with a physician who uh, actually has my utmost admiration for what he did during those times he actually uh, allowed an ABC7 team, I think, into the uh, into the ICU during the height of COVID. It, it is not. It, I mean, it's it's like a uh, it's a horror movie. You know, it, it was it it was not pretty to see, and what was going on was not. I mean, I I, I just don't know how our guys did it. Uh, our healthcare first line providers. Uh, it. it and so all they we couldn't do it well you know they uh i suppose i could have donned on uh you know a biohazard suit and, and try to go in and do something but i'm uh I, i'm not a brave person quite the opposite and uh so i was genuinely scared um and so the only way that my team and, and most of our guys could help was to say to answer the the main question that our management had how bad is it going to get and so that was like March 2020, the end of March 2020, beginning of April. And so, and the, and the curve, the infection curve was going up exponentially, like <laughs> e to the power of X. Uh, and then there was no end in sight. And so they were trying to figure out what, what, what should we expect? Should we expect 300 patients in our hospital, 3,000, 30,000? Um, and so what, what my team did, uh, we got the data we got the data from uh from chicago from uh from the county uh from the state and we kind of aggregated that data and created a fairly simple um sir they call it uh, uh susceptible infected recovered model it's a it's a standard model known since the 1920s uh but there were a few little twists so i took some of the of the approaches that I, I use in finance, uh, specifically what's called bootstrapping, uh, used to calculate different interest rates. And I applied that technique to this model. I think that was the only uh, kind of novel thing that we did compared to uh, many others who did exactly the same thing. And so we came up with a model that was uh, reasonably accurate given the circumstances, answered the questions that our management was looking to, 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 to see. They were not looking to see uh, exactly how many patients will be there tomorrow, but they were trying to figure out, well, what's what's the ballpark? What's the kind of the the, the ratio of what we have today to what we, we're going to have in a week's time? Uh, and so that that helped. And then in the end, we actually did one other thing that I'm not aware of anybody else doing that. Uh, so we looked at the accuracy of this model. And it turned out that the model was, in some instances, was okay, especially with respect to short-term predictions. Didn't do as well with respect to long-term predictions, but that's, you know, no, nobody expected us to. Uh, and so we did get a, a publication out of this. Um, and so uh, if any of your viewers are interested, I, I, I sent you the link. You can you can post it or or they can just take my word for it. Um, so that's, that's kind of the contribution and, and, uh, that, that was appreciated, uh, that did to some extent help project what kind of resources, uh, will need to be used and what, what the demand on our, if the strain on our resources would be. And so I, that, that was just one data point in decision-making that was not, of course, deciding or determining or anything that, that everybody looked at in awe, but it was one additional extra decision point 
which helped our management navigate those uncharted waters and and hopefully uh it helped them uh in in some way make better decisions than they would have otherwise made again the methodology was nothing new there, there was a very small tweak that that we implemented there uh but it turned out to be somewhat helpful yeah i, I think um during covid everybody was very like a uh, panic and you just mentioned like around March and April and uh, things start getting really worse and it's like a horror movie yeah and I think uh, all those um, uh, models really helps to kind of help out with like the the hospitals to make sure that or the physicians to make sure that they can take care of all those types of uh, like issues and by taking from the state uh, those are probably the 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 institution that has all the data uh, during that time. So I think yeah, those th those are great. And uh, as well, we we talk a lot about uh, AI. So uh, do you see that extra uh, XR um, AR VR um, um, in healthcare uh, combined with AI. I usually refer to spatial AI, but some people might say it's XR AI. Uh, what, what do you see like a combined with uh, AI, XR and data science that can help in the healthcare? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, the way I see things happening uh, well, first and foremost, you can like with respect to AI, one thing that comes to mind immediately is a uh, virtual scribe. So a physician, let's say, talks to a patient, of course, with patient's consent, uh, there's an AI appliance sitting somewhere recording the conversation. Uh, now, again, I'm admitting all the legal and ethical issues that may arise, but assuming everybody's uh, happy with that. Uh, so instead of the physician going back and then transcribing their own notes or have hiring a scribe to do that, uh, AI will, will just take that conversation and turn unstructured data into structured data. So this patient immediately, so the stuff that, that this is the holy grail of all kind of um, healthcare analytics, right? How do you take unstructured data, for example, in, in patient notes and turn it into zeros and ones or or some kind of categorical or numerical data? So that, that would certainly uh, make the physician's job much easier or nurse's job for that matter, much easier, save a lot of time and, and, and let them take care of the patient better. Uh, listen to the patient more and, and type on the computer less. Uh, so I see that one, uh, definitely image recognition, um, that is definitely helpful. Uh, so again, that would make the, the it's not gonna take away the radiologist's jobs, but it's gonna make their life easier. Um, in terms of um, VR, the first thing that comes to mind, like you mentioned, Dominic, uh, training, right? So you can you can simulate a uh, you know a trauma event, a uh, an emergency situation. You can train medical doctors, uh, if it, surgeons, something. So you could you you could basically uh, do something in virtual reality that you don't necessarily want to do in real life or it's just it's just too expensive in any sense of the word. So that would certainly be very helpful. And you could have some kind of an assistant, uh, kind of a uh, gentle professor and some kind of empathic AI who would, as you're, let's say, you're cutting your virtual patient up and says, well, if I were you, I, w I would move the scalpel two millimeters to the left type of thing. And I'm just speculating here. So that that's kind of what comes to mind uh, immediately when you say uh, VR in, in in healthcare. It could be uh, something along the lines of physicians and patients kind of establishing contact, trying to see uh, maybe having a virtual a better experience at a virtual visit, uh, maybe figuring out if you know which physician fits which patient better type of thing, uh, finding the best provider you can. So those, those again, we, we won't know until we get there. Yeah, just like you mentioned that uh, in VR, there are a lot of really good way, and especially for training. As I remember, one of the experts told me that she'd rather that the virtual patient died than the real patient died. It's like, <laughs> it's not a good thing, but it's just show how right. serious 
things will happen. And yep. uh, I remember when I was working on the project, I was trying to, because I am a, a, a person who like very specific things to code mm -hmm. because it's easier for me to structure the entire uh, software. Yes. So um, I asked like, do you want like a step-by-step -step guidance? And she mm -hmm. said, no. I want people in chaos and using critical thinking to think. So um, each staff need to have different time and each task has different priorities. For example, something is high priority. For example, if you don't do this, a patient will die immediately or versus uh, this thing you can postpone to at the end. So she right. wants to show the consequence which should make the entire project very complicated. But I, yeah. <laughs> so. so it's like a video game. Yeah, yeah. it's like an open sand video games and you need mm -hmm. to jump in without any clue. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, if something you didn't take in care of, something mm -hmm. will die and you will get shocked. And it's yeah. better to happen in the virtual world than in the oh, real world. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so do you have any last uh, like uh, things you want to mention? For example, like uh, how, um, how do you see this like a uh, uh, data science um, kind of um, apply into the future? What do you see the future of this, uh, this area uh, to, to, to grow? And also like uh, anything you want to mention? Uh, at the end? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I mean, kind of philosophical things that, that sometimes they write them in textbooks, but when you read it in a textbook, you may not understand it. Like, you know, um, you know, remember now, understand later type of thing. So, um, so one thing is patients don't come to physicians to, uh, to get the most accurate diagnosis, and uh, you know, and, and and get an algorithm of of what they need to do and get out. They come to to healthcare in many instances for compassion, for human touch, uh, for 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 an for a sympathetic ear. So that stuff, uh, you know, there is. Uh, and, and then the scary part here is that uh, AI is getting so good at certain things that you may think that your physician wrote this note for you and they're kind and caring and sympathetic, but in reality, they just typed three lines into some AI appliance and it generated that that warm and, and uh, comforting letter for them. I personally, I, I, I'm not comfortable with that thought. Uh, so this is, I mean, you know, and then some people may, you know, may like it and, and then may be important to them, but I think... AI can help with routine and road tasks. Uh, it can certainly like take away. So like, I, I think a, uh, you know, a, um, a robotic vacuum is a good example. So yes, it can go around on its own and, and clean up and uh, suck up the, the pet hair and, and do everything while you're doing something, you know, browsing the web or, or doing something fun at the same time. Uh, it's not going to get into the minute crevices, at least not yet. And it won't know what to do. Uh, let's say, for example, if it sees, uh, you know, water on the floor, it wouldn't know what's good, that your dishwasher is, you know, the valve is broken type of thing. So there, there are certain things that AI can and will do. Uh, it's scary for me to think that, um, eventually AI will be good at doing everything that we do and even better, uh, including emotions, because then what are we for? Uh, so the, um, again, the, the, the most important thing at right now in healthcare, as I see it is, uh, workflows and procedures and patient treatment and patient contact. It's less about, um, accuracy and precision and uh, automating things that uh, you know that that can necessarily cannot be easily automated. So it, I, I think we'll we'll get there. I think certainly there's no question that having the whole essentially the way I think about AI is the, you have a uh, the history of whole humanity on a on a flash drive. So you can in in, in the history of every single decision that has been made to date. Um, on, available at your fingertips. Yes, you can, in 99% of the cases, you can make the right decision by looking what pe other people have done in the past. But it's that 1% uh, 
where you cannot, for example, you cannot take the paintings of uh, uh, of uh, Rubens and derive a painting of Picasso from that. It's not easy to do. So that that's the one percent that uh, makes humans human. Uh, or or the you know the 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 tears, the emotions, the the laughter. That stuff uh, again. I hope it will never become AIable, if you permit me this this kind of word. Uh, but if it does, yeah, it, it definitely will be scary. So um, you know, not that that that's all I can say. I'm not a philosopher. I am just a lowly, uh, you know, data scientist slash software developer. So forgive me for that. I mean, just echo what you said that, yeah, like uh, AI right now, a lot of leaders start throwing out like AGI, all those types of things. And uh, currently I'm working or teaching uh, the young kids, like uh, um, probably Gen Z. So that's why I recently studied a lot of Gen Z. And uh, I watched another talk from uh, Professor uh, Scott um, Gale, um, he, he, he mentioned that uh, Gen Z was pretty much the generation couldn't really get like a, a generation cannot really um, kind of like a, get benefit from AI because AI pretty much take over or raise the bar of mediocre and uh, the Gen Z pretty much gets through COVID and they were distanced from school so they couldn't I watch another YouTube video. It seems like, uh, according to the statistics, Gen Z doesn't have friends. So they are pre pretty much isolated. And uh, the single rate was very high. And also they are a little bit against the, 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 the another generation. And they couldn't, like, for example, like even senior got laid off. How about the junior? So senior was trying to take the junior's job. So a lot of Gen Zs, they just keep getting another degree, another degree and living with parents and trying to mm -hmm. figure out what to do. So what do you see like the future for the younger folks? Like, uh, for example, like uh, people just graduate from school, doesn't have amazing experience like you, like they are data scientist. What, what, what do you suggest? Oh, another minefield. Yeah, I have I have two kids who I guess you can you can think of them as uh, Gen Zers. Uh, they they were born uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, and so they do have it, it. It seems to be a pervasive issue. They, they they do have difficulty with you know with with pretty good education and and credentials. Uh, it's just. Like, well, think about it. Even, let's say, for example, even if you're the best qualified applicant and uh, AI is the gatekeeper for the job, you just keep sending resumes and, and they go into a black hole, right? Because you don't match that keyword or, or there's something else. So there, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong, including bias. Um, and it's because people who program AI, they, they program it based on the data set available to them. So there, I'm sure philosophers and ethicists and uh, and and politicians, uh, again, kind of tongue in cheek, are thinking about and looking for uh, for good solutions. Um, it is, I mean, there's a lot of talk about uh, the widening gap between the haves and have nots. You know, I'm sure you you heard about the guaranteed minimum income right uh so then then some the the elite of the population will be enjoying all the doing the interesting work enjoying all the the fruit of of their labor and and programming the ai and the rest of us will be left to our own devices to fill our days right you don't need to work what what do you do uh but uh i think i mean not not to end this on an, on a pessimistic note i think so far uh, the the humans have been able to find their way out of difficult situations. So this is just like you know the first industrial revolution. It took away a lot of jobs. So and and then the second and and the third. You know if you are what are you going to do if you are an experienced stoker on a steam engine, uh, or you're an experienced typist, a secretary who who, who types I don't know 120 signs a minute or whatnot. Uh, I don't know. Just, just speculating here. Uh, so it is. It can lead to uh, to very 
difficult consequences, but I'm hoping that the new generation is resilient enough and smart enough to find a solution and to turn this into their benefit as opposed to um, to, to detriment. But, uh, you know, it's not it's no fun to win an easy game, right? So when they find that solution, they will so much will be so happy and, and so feel so accomplished that it will enhance their lives. That's my hope. Yeah. So um, recently, I also listened to Sam Oman. He in one podcast, he mentioned that he, uh, he and his folks predict in the future, there will be like a, pretty soon there will be 10 people company, a very small company uh, value $10 billion. And uh, pretty soon there will be one person value ten billion dollars company, like because AI do everything for you. So you everybody becomes the business owner. And uh, I find out that the interesting thing is that in this era, if you are the capitalist or if you are the investor or you own a company, you love AI, or you are a product owner, you love AI. But if you are trading your time in exchange with money, then you mm -hmm. don't like AI. So maybe the future of AI is making everybody to become entrepreneur, to start your own 10 billion business. Or maybe because I, um, I also listened to another kind of talk. It means it, it seems like in the future, we don't limit it to inside the earth. We might go out and get some different resources and do the uh, I don't know, um, Star War or something. Everybody have a, his or her own yeah. planet. So it, it, it's very interesting to see that before we, we have the traditional mindset that I have to work for somebody in order to get paid. But maybe AI is the time for us to think that everybody is the capitalist capitalist and also the product owner and we don't i mean ai will work for everybody and yeah it's a one person operate and all the robots serve for you i don't know it's just like it's so <laughs> that's a very interesting thought i certainly <laughs> I, I would love to see that i don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime but you know cool yeah thank you so much for um uh, taking the interview um and uh, uh that's it for this episode Thank you for listening. We release episodes weekly. If you enjoyed this conversation, check out our other episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Support us by giving us a follow and a five-star rating or subscribe to our channel and give this video a like. Thank you so much and see you next time. Thank you, Dominic.